Welcome everyone to uh, the, the third session of today. And this one is really just such a fascinating session because um, it's one of those topics we would have never thought to have uh, in the conference, but we received just incredible um, abstracts from the community around these innovative use cases of DHIS2 for event-based surveillance. So I'm sure um, many people know that more than 20, 30 countries are using DHIS2 for IDSR and indicator-based surveillance. Um, but there's been some really incredible innovations uh, throughout the community. And um, we'd like to share some of those stories with you today. So um, our first presenter is Emma Ibazibwe of HIST Uganda. And in Uganda, DHIS2, it's been used as the National Electronic Case-Based Disease Surveillance System. And so I'm, I'm very pleased to welcome Emma to share how um, integration with the mobile SMS platform has really been able to enrich this uh, integrated disease surveillance system with community-based reporting of um, events and analysis. So welcome, Emma, the floor is yours if you'd like to share your screen. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, I'm requesting you share your screen with my slides. Okay, I can pull that up. Just give me a moment. Okay, is this showing up? Uh, yes, it is. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, floor is yours. Go ahead. Uh, uh, could you do presentation mode? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. My name is uh, Emma Ayabazwe, and I work as a project officer on the EIDSR IHR project for HISP Uganda. Um, and I'm here to talk about the event-based disease surveillance system and the rumor monitoring for that we are currently working with for, for Uganda. Uh, next. Uh, Rebecca, next. I think there might be a lag. Do you see the correct screen? Uh, yeah, there is a lag. Um, so we this was developed based on the IDSR, uh, the previous one. Um, so um, this was developed based on the based on the guide IDSR guidelines uh, from uh, from WHO and uh, with they were trying to encourage the use of uh, electronic systems. Okay, I'm sorry about that, Emma. Is it showing up correctly now? Yeah, yes, it is, thank you. So um, our implementation is based on the IDSR technical guidelines, which recommend the use of uh, immediate reporting of notifiable diseases electronically. And this can be through email, SMS, or phone calls. And Uganda has adopted the use of uh, the SMS platform, which is working uh, hand in hand with uh, the DHS2 mobile configuration app. Uh, the integration of the two platforms allows the rapid relay of information about events uh, from the community and um, for people describing potential risk within the community. So these are targeted, targeted people. It is anonymous in nature, but we are targeting people that have been trained and we expect them to report from the community. Uh, into fr from the community about any events that might be uh, that might require district response or national response uh, from them. Then 
uh, to facilitate to further facilitate immediate reporting now this is for the indicator based reporting there is uh, an aggregate data report that is submitted on a weekly basis uh, from the health facilities using the same platform and this data is uh, then integrated into the national uh, HMIS system that is uh, on the DHIS2 platform. Next. Um, so the key configuration is uh, there is a gateway in EIDSR that has been configured to receive traffic from a keyword uh, that is alert. So like I mentioned, we've, uh, we've set up um, an unregistered parser that allows uh, unregistered users to send anonymous events into the system using uh, a, a Ministry of Health Uganda code uh, to inform about what is happening uh, in their communities. Then this has been configured to further provide feedback to the people who are sending alerts, uh, as we'll see in the coming slides, the kind of feedback they, re they receive. Uh, the same platform is also a conduit between the community and EIDSR as it tries to as it tries to it is a conduit between uh, EIDSR and the community as it provides feedback uh, from the community. So our current workflow is uh, we have a VHT, a healthcare worker or a community leader who has been trained to send an SMS uh, with the keyword alert to 6767. And uh, this SMS is, uh, is received by the National uh, Public Health Emergency Team at uh, Ministry of Health, who, are then, who then verify the alert SMSs and uh, uh, prepare a response team uh, to be able to, to provide uh, the necessary response to any of the community. Uh, in case it turns out to be a risk or an actual event, they'll prepare a rapid response team either national or district, these are based on uh, how intense the situation is. So if it can be managed by the district, then the district response team will be sent. Otherwise, uh, the national response team is going to be uh, sent uh, to be able to handle this. Uh, next. Uh, Rebecca, do we still have a lag? I suppose we do. I don't think there's much I can do. I, I can share it this way if that's easier. How about we try it this way? Um, you must just say verbally which slide you're on because the rest of us All can right. see it. I think um, so. Uh, No, th this is the slide we, were, we are going on. Uh, so using uh, any of the registered SIM cards, uh, Uganda registered SIM cards, uh, a, an individual, uh, a community person will send a description of, uh, of alerts from their community uh, stating uh, what they are seeing or describing what they are seeing and telling us uh, from the location, that is the village, the parish, the sub-county and the district. So once this is sent into the system, the, the team at a national level, that is the Public Health Emergency Center, they'll verify uh, by trying to either make a phone call uh, to the team, uh, by making a phone call to the person who sent, because as we know, DHIS2 registers the number of, it picks the number of the person who sent this SMS. So they will try to follow up or try to verify uh, this alert with a phone call before they send it out to, 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 to the, they, they send out a team to do further investigations. So um, the, this notification, once it is verified, a notification is now sent. This is either email or SMS. It is sent to either a program uh, that is in charge of managing uh, uh, the, uh, this disease or condition or it is sent out to the rapid response team at the district level or the national level. 
uh, to be able to do uh, the investigations. And right there in the middle, we have uh, uh, feedback that, that is sent back to to aid to the senders, letting them know that their message has been received, and uh, there is a team that is currently uh, work, working on that particular uh, issue for verification. Next. Um, so we we have been working on uh, we have been working on this since uh, 2013, uh, and in 2019 we we tried to revise the situation. We met up with us. Uh, we're supposed to be on slide six. I, I hope there is no lag. Uh, they, they, we sent we we had a meeting or we went back on the drawing board to try and see how to engage people uh, at the district level. And uh, they shared some of the gaps with the current workflow uh, because of because the SMSs go straight to the ministry uh, without uh, engaging without first engaging the district teams. They felt they were left out, and uh, these are some of the gaps that were identified. There was uh, untimeliness to the response. Uh, this is due to the a lot of uh, SMSs or alerts that come in and uh, there is no HR to particularly verify all of these. And then uh, the screening of alerts or events was cumbersome. And this is, uh, th this is uh, due to, um, uh, th this is due to uh, very few people to handle this and also how the SMS has come in. We don't really have uh, coded messages and all that. The messages are a bit unstructured. Uh, when they are sent out. So you have to like read through and confirm before you can actually verify. Then at certain points, these are uh, delayed feedback to the users and this uh, demotivates them. Uh, especially recently we had a change in the uh, gateway in the third parties service provider. So there is a sort of delay to, to get feedback to the, to the teams on ground and they get demotivated. They feel like their messages are not reaching uh, where they're supposed to go. And there is a poor documentation of the rumors at health facilities and districts. Uh, they do not have logbooks or they do not have a structured ways of uh, recording any of the rumors or alerts that come in inability to analyze uh, rumors or events. Uh, at the end of the day, one of the biggest things has been how many SMSs have you received? How many can be reported by disease and so on and so forth. And then there is no special mechanism to respond to rumors that come through, for example, social media. Uh, we, we have a lot of uh, social media present and we expect some of uh, the rumors that come in would be through social media. So there is no special mechanism uh, of doing that. Now in our, we've tried to come up with a solution to tackle most of uh, the, these uh, gaps that have been identified by the community. Uh, next. Uh, and the biggest challenge uh, was uh, how do we involve uh, the district teams in the process of verification? How do they find out about uh, conditions, uh, about uh, how do they handle conditions within their community before either the minister or any other uh, big person knows about it? Because uh, someone was like, I don't like the minister or an MP telling me what, what problem is happening in my community. I need to be able to to know about this firsthand and not uh, third hand from a, a political official. So the revised workflow uh, still involves uh, healthcare workers, uh, VHTs and community leaders sending SMSs to 6767, clearly indicating the location and then using the DHIS to SMS management app. Uh, this is something that we've come up with uh, as a team at HISP Uganda using uh, this particular app, the public health emergency center is supposed to route or forward these alerts to, um, to, to, to the respective districts based on the location that was previously stated. And then it is now the district teams that are supposed to verify uh, these alerts and while, uh, while filling in uh, an e-log. So the e-log, 
uh, is there to, to be able to indicate the verification process and whether you are able to verify uh, to determine a true alert or a false alert. And then the district team will also go ahead and dispatch their investigation team to conduct uh, further investigations. Uh, next. Um, uh, Rebecca, this particular slide, we, we need to be in a presentation mode. Uh, thank you. Okay, so we've developed an app that is uh, installed in the EIDSR and we are calling this the SMS management app. And uh, this management app provides uh, analytics based on uh, the SMSs received. Uh, we're able to determine uh, SMSs received. We're able to determine those that have been forwarded for verification and uh, the status of uh, verification and so on. Uh, it is further able to produce an e-log which has been integrated uh, uh, just a minute which has been further integrated into a single event program in, uh, in the EIDSR DHS2 platform. And then the e-log actions can be monitored both at national and district level. So if there is a delay in the process of verification, the national team is able to follow up with the district surveillance focal person on why uh, certain uh, certain activities are taking longer than they should for, for verification. So right there, you're looking at the dashboard. Uh, we have a total SMS messages received, then you have the total alerts. And um, the next screen is showing us uh, what the public health information, public health emergency center screen looks like. They have the received alerts or messages uh, next. And uh, basing on the basing on the districts within the SMS, they'll be able to forward this uh, to the particular district. Uh, we saw it was Arua, so they will be able to forward this to Arua, and then the district person will come and look at the forwarded alerts. So their screen will be re around forwarded alerts uh, next. And uh, they can go ahead and uh, update events accordingly uh, based on the verification information that they're getting uh, from the community. And yeah, so this is the screen that they use for verifying. And as status changes, the system is able to record uh, the status updates regarding the system. They can save if they are not able to get all the information in one go. However, if they do, then they can just update it. Uh, next. Um, so at the end of the day, you, you have a complete form. So there is an e-log that is recorded in the background and we're able to generate data using that. And then we can also uh, try to determine the status of uh, what is happening in the community and be able to follow up on this. So the revised workflow is, uh, ha is, is involving the district teams at the time of alert verification. It is also providing timely response to the alerts in the district. There is no uh, a delay between uh, going to national level and then another person has to uh, share this information. And then we are able to monitor progress of the alert verification by both the national team and the district team. Then we are able to log alerts and uh, we are also able to analyze our alerts at various levels and using uh, various disaggregations uh, within the system. So these uh, presentations can be done either within the app or outside of, uh, outside of the app and using uh, the DHIS2 uh, legacy tools. Uh, to present. Uh, next. Two minute warning. And yes, I meant implementation slides, implementation challenges.
Yeah, so the our implementation challenges were also the gaps that were identified and uh, I'm sure HR is still going to be a very big issue, but uh, we're trying now, we try to solve the issue at national level and we're trying to engage uh, the district teams in the process of verification. Then reviewing of messages is challenging because of uh, missing information. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, the SMS or the alert is uh, unstructured in nature. So some people tend to miss, uh, miss out on the revealing information about the alerts that they send. There is a uh, delayed feedback or relay of messages due to gateway stability. Uh, I also mentioned we had uh, a new uh, third party service provider and uh, there, there, a bit of, uh, there is a bit of instability in the service provision there or the connection between a DHIS2 and the uh, telecom companies. Then there, is, uh, there was lack of proper documentation, but we hope now with the ability to verify and record your findings, uh, this is also solved with, within the application. Um, limited data use. So our next goal is to try and increase uh, the use of this data at various levels, uh, especially since we are able now to analyze uh, how the events come in by period, by uh, uh, categories and so on and so forth. Then uh, media and social, social media is still uh, going to be a problem, but within the app, we've tried to see how to add uh, uh, alerts that are not necessarily coming in as SMS, but they're coming in through other channels. So we are also trying to collect that information and we will see how to incorporate that. Now, one of the biggest challenges of implementation is actually language barrier because uh, the people we meet, although they might be able to speak English, they don't necessarily know how to write English. Uh, it's still a bit of a problem. And um, uh, for Uganda, we have uh, a lot of uh, languages, so we cannot say, send it in your local language, the person at national level might not be able to understand your local language. So uh, the, the language barrier is still, uh, uh, it's still going to be a very big problem um, that we actually don't know how to solve. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Rebecca. Thank you so much, Emma, for this use case from, from Uganda. And I apologize for, for the technical difficulties on my side. I really do. Um, but this was an amazing presentation. We also have it available for folks to download from the um, SCED site. So I'm very pleased to welcome our next presenter, um, who is uh, Natalie Tibbles from the Johns Hopkins University, the ba Breakthrough Action um, Project. And so, Natalie, this was uh, such an interesting uh, abstract when, when I read it and, and what I find particularly um, inspiring is, is how um, different partners such as JHU are starting to use this metadata packaging approach to disseminate their designs. So Natalie, the floor is yours to uh, discuss how have you have used uh, DHIS2 to combat misinformation around COVID-19. I will stop sharing my screen now. Thanks. Okay, are you able to hear me and see my slides? Rebecca, I'll rely on you for time. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Looks um, good. Thanks. So I'm Natalie Tibbles. I'm a monitoring officer with the Johns Hopkins Center for Communication Programs. We go by CCP, so you'll hear that a lot today. My colleague who co designed the system I'm presenting um, today in Cote d'Ivoire is Abdul Doso, and he, he works in the Cote d'Ivoire um, CCP office, and he'll be presenting for the Francophone teams uh, in the next hour. Um, so, CCP is an academic center within the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, and we primarily work on social and behavior change programming, as well as knowledge management, advocacy, and applied research. That's my focus. Uh, we work in over 30 countries, and the Breakthrough Action Project is a partnership led by CCP with a variety of partners. It's a five-year global project funded by USAID to lead their social behavior change programming around the world. So we work on a variety of health areas, including family planning, reproductive health, malaria, maternal and child health, nutrition, neglected tropical diseases. And personally, I worked most in HIV, where I first met DHIS2, um, projects on ending child early enforced marriage, 
and on the Global Health Security Agenda Programs, or GHSA. So GHSA is a group of 70 countries, international organizations, NGOs, private sector companies, whose goal is to address gaps in countries' abilities to prevent, detect, and respond to infectious disease threats. And as part of GHSA, Breakthrough Action contributes to SBC programming, SBC is Social Behavior Change Programming, uh, designed to increase capacity for risk communication. So we, as we've seen in repeated Ebola outbreaks, COVID pandemic, and many, many other health um, emergencies, the ability to quickly bring an outbreak under control requires behavior change, to wear masks, to report cases, to seek care. And these behaviors are preceded by determinants such as knowledge, attitudes, norms, trust, self-efficacy, so risk communication is the real-time exchange of information then between officials and people facing, facing a threat. Who's, and the goal of risk communicators is to enable them to take informed action to protect their health. So integrating SBC approaches into risk communication interventions, then the idea is to support the shift of behavior and social norms. So for example, we facilitate community engagement to foster trust, which allows for better uptake of recommended behaviors, early reporting, et cetera. Um, we work to enhance coordination between different partners to allow for harmonized approaches across channels. Uh, we invite communities and local responders and leaders into the process of identifying rumors and information and sharing the concerns of the population with people who can kind of address them through risk communication. And that's what I'm talking about today. So this may seem really basic, but we, we use the word rumor we, and we often don't define it. So what is a rumor and why focus on, on documenting rumors? Rumor, a rumor is an act of communication that contains unverified or false information. And rumors emerge when there's not enough accurate information or when there's simply too much information. So many of you know the WHO is called the COVID pandemic an infodemic for this reason, that there's just too much conflicting information and that makes it hard for people to discern who to trust and what is right and thus what action to take. So people share rumors for a variety of reasons and thinking through this really helps me kind of have empathy. <laughs> um, sometimes people share in good faith, we call that misinformation, they, they wanna help. Um, people have a desire to explain things and to make sense of what's going on in their lives. And rumors can be a way to cope with uncertainty or suffering. Of course, some people do uh, spread disinformation, which you know, from a technical perspective is the propagation of rumors intentionally to disrupt or to make a profit or for economic or political gain. Some rumors are harmless, but others can under undermine the public health response in a variety of ways. They can harm individuals' actual just physical health, such as the rumor that was circulating early on that drinking bleach would cure COVID. They can create barriers for people accessing services, such as the idea that Ebola treatment units were actually infecting people or they can create obstacles to prevention behaviors, such as the rumor that masks were contaminated with COVID. They can stigmatize groups perceived to be exposed or at risk. And fundamentally, they can undermine trust in public health authorities in the response. Um, so there are also times that rumors are true. And I always feel <laughs> need to mention this, you know, uh, from a response perspective, we can get kind of high and mighty about the whole thing, but there are rumors, for example, there were there have been rumors in different emergencies that humanitarian aid workers were abusing people they were supposed to be serving. And there have been times that that's true. And this so-called rumor was a signal of something that urgently needed to be investigated and stopped. Um, so our goal then of a rumor management system is to systematize somehow rumors that rapidly emerge in communities so that our awareness of the rumors can inform social behavior change interventions, as well as on occasion, really follow up the situation that's occurring. Um, some systems that we're implementing through CCP capture rumors about COVID-19, others are about zoonotic diseases, you know, not, not COVID-19 or other health areas like HIV or family planning. So to design a rumor management system, we were looking for a digital solution, of course, with a set of features. We wanted cloud-based, able to collect, store, and visualize rumors in an integrated way. We wanted the, the system to function under kind of business as usual um, uh, conditions, but also be able to rapidly activate and scale in an emergency. And we wanted the system to be able to incorporate rumors from various sources, both people directly reporting in, as well as you know, importing from secondary sources and social media. And so the task really is, how do you organize and process this unstructured data in so-called real time? Quantitative data entry is fairly, 
uh, quantitative data is fairly easy. You know, you said the data collection forms, not easy. I shouldn't say many of you are doing really crazy, amazing things, but um, you know, you can define the indicators in advance and they can populate as you go along once you've set up the whole system with unstructured data, as Emma pointed out, um, made a very good point. You know, you, it takes time to process and review that. And so how can you do that in a systematic and rigorous way? Um, I wanna draw your attention to the principles for digital development, which is a really helpful tool for assessing your technology um, solution. So in our case, the system, the rumor tracking system is not just the technology, it's the network of contributors who recognize and report rumors, partners who share data to mine for misinformation, data managers, stakeholders who review and actually respond to and address the rumors, but the technology is critical and you want a technology that is sustainable, affordable, secure, and fits in well with how countries are already managing health related information. So as we're hearing today, you know, this type of system is not CCB's completely new idea. We're fitting into an ecosystem of health surveillance, health communication, rumor management, and we want to make sure we're serving the interests and needs of each context and not duplicating. Um, and so a lot of these principles help us kind of assess that and develop a technology that's going to work. So we looked at a variety of platforms, Google Suite, Kobo, a few other platforms, but we settled on DHIS2 as the database because of many of these principles. So I want to go into a brief overview of how the system works, and then I'll go into a little depth on each stage. We collect rumors either by having trained contributors enter them, enter what they hear into the system through the DHIS2 app, the just off the shelf um, collection app or we import from secondary sources using the Data Z app. Um, data managers then code, analyze, and th synthesize rum rumors. And here again, I'm uh, using rumor to refer to misinformation, to beliefs, not necessarily events. We share the rumor um, information very frequently, sometimes twice a week with government and other partners through briefs, presentations, and emergency coordination meetings, and of course, through access to the dashboards. Uh, and then we offer technical support for risk communication and also directly implement mass media, social media campaigns and community engagement informed by this data. There are a variety of sources for rumor data, surveys, social media, uh, qualitative research studies, the real-time contributors that I mentioned and other secondary, secondary sources. Um, and we've used all these sources and incorporating them, incorporated them in, in various settings, but um, we have primarily relied on the community-based contributors and hotlines and SMS lines. Um, and many other partners, Red Cross and others have been doing this for a long time uh, for emergencies like Ebola. So um, all the rumor data goes into an event program, typically at the district level or subnational one or two level. Uh, we have a section to enter the raw rumors, just unstructured data and answer a few descriptive questions. And then you can see that the actual, the people entering the data, rumor data, the rumor, uh, apply topical codes, which I'll talk more about in a minute. Um, I wanted to just pause and talk a little bit about, again, kind of how we're conceptualizing the system. So we train contributors to remove names and addresses of individuals when they're submit, submitting rumors. Uh, during the coding process, we watch out for inferential identifiers. Um, where even if a direct identifier isn't included, someone might be identified through inference. For example, you know, the chief of a certain village and there's only one chief, someone could figure out who that's talking about. And this is a key point because this is an, a social behavior change tool to inform risk communication, not a surveillance system as we normally think about it. So it's somewhat, somewhat different from other types of rumor systems where the purpose is to investigate events. You know, there, So we do accept reports you know, of an outbreak or a problem in a certain place and then refer it to, to the authorities. But for us, that's not the primary purpose of the system. We're not attempting to track people down who are spreading rumors or the first person who started the rumor and punish or persuade. Uh, we're not tracking people, we're tracking ideas. And so for the key informants, we prompt them with, uh, what are people saying about COVID-19? And we ask them to submit, I've heard people say, or people are saying dot, dot, dot because it helps remind them and those interpreting our data that we're not trying to track down individuals. So this does involve some limitations on the amount of information provided about the original source of the rumor. And, you know, so it's not a survey, it's not population representative, it's the snapshot of community concerns, of misinformation, and it allows us to rapidly identify potentially problematic misinformation to nip in the bud before it becomes a problem, ideally. <laughs> uh, and that allows us to inform 
risk communication and community engagement by representing some of the concerns at a given time in the population. It's an SBC tool for an SBC response. In terms of processing the rumors, then we have dedicated data managers who code the data as it comes in. We code first topically, then we group similar rumors into belief statements that summarize you know, the specific theme. Then we classify the belief statements according to their urgency and harmfulness. Our CCP staff around the world have years of research and programmatic experience to analyze social and communication data. And so this is where that expertise comes in. For example, early on in the pandemic with the system in Cote d'Ivoire, we received a cluster of rumors uh, before vaccines were authorized or available. So here are some of the rumors. When you go to the hospital, it's a COVID vaccine they're giving you. People are saying not to trust vaccine or vaccines or get your kids vaccinated. If someone says you need a vaccine, it's because they need to make us guinea pigs. So all, you know, those rumors all would be a, would receive the topical code vaccine and maybe the care seeking code. But we also synthesize it into a belief statement, something like routine va vaccines are actually COVID vaccines they're testing on us. If we rely just on the topical code, we would be stuck trying to develop messages on vaccine. You can't really do much with, you know, people are talking about vaccines. You need something more specific and actionable, you know, that people are believing that might undermine, for example, routine vaccinations. So the idea, if people believe that the polio vaccine is actually secretly a COVID vaccine that they're testing on your baby, you know, that's something we can assess and classify. Is this belief harmful? Yes, because if people believe it, they won't want to get the routine vaccines that protect their children. So we then recommend, you know, this is a rumor that warrants a response, and we're going to address it through risk communication and community engagement. We have deductive codes that we developed in advance, and then we add codes as themes emerge, and that those, those would be the inductive codes. So a challenge with adapting DHIS2 for rumor tracking is just accepting the idea that I'm creating a case management program, not for a person, but for an idea. I've run into this many times before doing SBC work. DHIS2 is designed, as far as I can tell, for standard health service information, yet I know I'm not alone because tracked entity type exists. So we find ourselves tracking community groups, local structures, such as schools, uh, I want to give a shout out to my friend Simon at Aswatini, who's innovating on this front with DHIS2. We track roles, we track communication materials, and now we're in the position of literally tracking ideas. Um, for those of you unfamiliar with this picture uh, or the media context in the US, it's from a popular show that basically makes a joke about someone who's trying to figure out something complicated and looks totally crazy. And this is how I felt trying to figure out what does it look like to case manage an idea, you know, a belief, a rumor. What are the attributes? What are the stages? What are the indicators? How do we really use and operationalize this thing? So we basically keep the raw data in the event program and then add the synthesized statements to a tracker program. We keep track of nuances, versions of rumor, according to that kind of checklist of harmfulness or threat, which we use to recommend if and how a rumor should be addressed. And then we document the response. We have an internal dashboard that tracks the number of submissions and if they've been coded and analyzed and if the coding has been verified, you know, in which health areas, the rumor addresses, things like that. We take a look at the sources and which sources are providing the, the sort of richness and nuance that we want. So you can see here, we looked at hotline submissions and submissions from the community contributors and the themes are similar if you, if you sort of break it down, but there is, more detail and richness in submissions from the community contributors. And looking at sources that way and kind of doing some analysis helps us uh, figure out where to invest in terms of our rumor sources. And really, you know, more is not always better. Um, you can't manage a volume of millions of rumors with a couple of data managers a month. You know, it might be in the hundreds or thousands that you're coding weekly or, or monthly. Um, and so you really want to manage your investments well. We share, so, okay. we share summaries on thematic dashboards that allow stakeholders to get a sense of what topics are common among submissions to the system. And we like to share illustrative rumors, some of the raw data, so stakeholders hear the voices of community members, not just the summary. Um, here you can see we've organized the raw data by belief statements. You know, the first is it's useless or dangerous to seek care. The second is COVID-19 doesn't kill Africans. So you have the belief statement that summarizes the theme, but then you also have the, the, the real kind of voice of the communities um, to look at. 
Um, user feedback has been positive. Community contributors described feeling inspired and equipped for their role as community listeners and reporters. They felt the system was easy to use and relevant and they wanted to continue to expand it. And the, um, the partners that we're working with in risk communication uh, did, were able to incorporate insights into a variety of responses. So in summary, really the bottom line is that DHIS2 can be repurposed, not to track individual people, but to track ideas. And in order to say the system is functioning, this is what we really want. We wanna be able to put unstructured data in and pull insights and decisions out. So through this process, we were able to set up a system in several CCP countries through the Breakthrough Action Country uh, Project, excuse me, and we prepared um, guidance documents and a DHIS2 metadata package to share with our own teams, but also made freely available. It's not a new app, it's just the metadata for the, the event form, program rules, indicators, user groups, and updating it with the tracker program as well. So I'm not a developer, I'm just an ME person learning DHIS2 as I go. Um, so shout out to all the non-developers here. Um, but I hope this is something that we can kind of move toward where when we come up with something, we share it with one another, try it out and work together, you know, to save ourselves time and improve the work we're doing through DHIS2. A very big thanks to my colleague, Abdul Doso, who has co-designed the system, and to Marla Shavitz, who's on the call, our director of digital strategies at CCP, who encouraged me to share this approach more widely, and really all my colleagues in different countries who are adapting this approach and sharing what they learn. So thank you for your time, and I'm looking forward to continue growing DHIS2 skills this week with you all. Thank you, Natalie. That was, that was a great presentation. Um, Hua, um, you're welcome to go ahead and share your screen at this time. Um, okay. I just found this so fascinating, the differences between the event-based surveillance and the rumor monitoring, but between Emma's and Natalie's presentation, still getting to this point of how can we use DHIS2 to try to structure what is unstructured data. So uh, with this, I'm very happy to introduce from PSI Vietnam, uh, Hoa Nguyen and Phuong La, who are going to uh, share their use case around strengthening um, event-based surveillance through, through chatbots and integration with provincial EOCs. So the floor is yours, uh, Hoa Nguyen. Uh, hello, uh, I'm Phuong from PSI Vietnam. Uh, can you see my screen, uh, Rebecca? We can, if you'd like to try it in presentation view, uh, but I can see the screen, yes. Uh, okay, yes. Okay, then this one second. Okay. Uh, how about now? Perfect, yes. Thank you. Okay, so uh, thank you, Rebecca, for your uh, introductions, and thank you, everyone, for for your interest in our EBS uh, session today. Uh, I'm Phuong from PSI Vietnam, and today uh, we at PSI Vietnam we would like to share with you our uh, experience in integrating a social media chatbot with the ATS2 for event-based surveillance by private sector. Um, so let me go, just give you a little bit of context why we built this system. Um, uh, in Vietnam, uh, EBS um, was first introduced in the early uh, 2010s uh, by the Vietnam Ministry of Health and supported by the United States Center of Disease Control and Prevention and the World Health Organizations. Um, however, it just started to expand it to all provinces in 2019. Uh, since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, popular COVID-19 uh, event-based surveillance signals uh, in Vietnam mainly came from uh, official quarantine units at point of entry, uh, media monitoring, uh, such as uh, social listening software, and um, individual health declaration either through uh, website or paper-based or uh, mobile phone app. And uh, we also had a um, close contact exposure history app. Um, however, uh, the signals uh, based mainly based on reports co or collected and submitted by uh, the public sector. Uh, private sec uh, private health outlets uh, um, hardly participate in the existing uh, surveillance system, uh, although one, although they are actually one of the first points of contact for people seeking care when having mild symptoms such as uh, fever or cough. Um, these uh, private outlets, especially pharmacy, don't really have a reporting habit or belong 
to an extensive network to report possible cases. And there are a limit, limit uh, of information on how EBS signals are consolidated, analyzed, or shared among stakeholders, such as local health authorities at different levels. Um, in this context, uh, PSI Vietnam developed a digital solution. Uh, it was all started with a um, simple idea. It was started with a malaria case a reporting chatbot integrated with the ESIS2 um, that we, we had already uh, used. And in August 2020, using the lesson learned from this malaria chatbot, uh, we developed a similar chatbot for reporting possible event cases um, by private outlets in the context of uh, COVID-19. And um, uh, on the right side, you can, can see um, an interface of, uh, of this chatbot in Vietnam. We are using a um, local messenger app called Zalo, uh, which is the most popular platform and provided in the Vietnamese language. Um, it is, um, the, this chatbot uh, is, um, uh, this chatbot uses uh, automated conversations to from questions for health authority, uh, health outlets to answer. Uh, therefore, they can enter necessary data for event-based surveillance into the SIS2. Um, the, that, the data that are collected through this chatbot is stored and analyzed on the SIS2, then presented on uh, various dashboards. As you can see on the on the left side, um, this is an example of a, of a map showing cluster of uh, possible cases. Um, the, the health outlets are uh, trained on site by uh, PSI staff on how to report possible cases. Um, with this chatbot, uh, we would like we would uh, we want to encourage uh, private health outlets to submit possible uh, event reports, uh, build network for reporting, uh, therefore collect and analyze data for tracking trends and uh, support local health authorities in uh, event-based surveillance for COVID-19. From there, we expect that the local health authorities would um, conduct appropriate uh, intervention. Um, after nine months of implementations, um, I think the results are quite promising. Uh, around 3,000 private health outlets are involved uh, with uh, more than 300 clinics and uh, 2,500 pharmacies in Fry uh, Project provinces. Um, our current coverage includes areas with high population densities and industrial zone. Um, around uh, 74,000 possible uh, cases and events with at least one common symptoms of COVID-19, either it's, uh, it was cough, fever, sore throat, or difficult breathing were reported by 61% uh, by 61, pri by 61 private outlets. 65% uh, of outlets report that they submit that the events report within 24 hours. And uh, the most common symptoms, uh, most common reported symptoms were cough, fever, and sore throat. Uh, among these uh, events submitted through this chatbot, 4.6% of them can be seen as uh, possible COVID-19 uh, cases, uh, meaning that they have three COVID-like symptoms, uh, fever, cough, or, and difficult breathing at the same time. Um, these symptoms frequencies are uh, visualized on the SIS2 to display on a heat map and also other graphs and individual event reports uh, to, to, to see if, uh, to, to display whether um, there are any cluster in a period of time. Uh, this is expected to, to help um, uh, local health authorities to monitor possible health issues and to investigate whether there something is uh, really going on in a particular area. Uh, now I'd like to invite my colleague Huan to uh, share about our collaborations with the health authorities and other lesson learned uh, in the process. Hua, uh, yeah, you. thanks, Fuang. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, thanks, Fuang. Uh, next slide, please. Next, next slide, please. 
And as mentioned above, As mentioned above, EPS currently expands in the home country since 2018, and following by decision of Ministry of Health in 2018, EPS procedure has five steps, including signal capture, signal triad, uh, verification, assessment, and intervention. And EPS currently a PSI and for private sector, we just stop at step one and two, which means that just only the data collection and only local health authorities take responsibility for signal verification to verify the signal to make sure that it becomes an event or not. BSI Vietnam collaborates closely with the Central, Central Disease Control CDC at provincial level and District Health Center for the remaining step of EPS. It's District Health Center and provincial CDC, they receive a training from BSI and then they had an account to accept into the DRS to uh, the dashboard, the COVID surveillance of their area. District Health Center take part of signal verification and event assessment. And CDC, uh, at province level, they oversee and manage data of all of the province and propose respond to events according to the District Health Center feedback. And as you may see at this slide, on the right side, um, some is it important that uh, uh, are demonstrated as yet added to dashboard, like the cluster and the alert distribution with high number of customers who have a fever. And on your left hand, and uh, you can uh, this is the number of the suspected case uh, and the local health authority they can see analysis by day, month, by gender, and the chain of the event. In addition. To evaluate the sustainability of chatbot. Next slide, please. BSI Vietnam did conduct a phone survey to evaluate user readiness and acceptability for reporting the signal. Uh, as you can see here, 65% of outlet participating in survey submitted report via chatbot within 24 hours. 81% user were willing to keep using chatbot in reporting suspected people of COVID-19. And among those who use both chatbot and individual health declaration, the one that my coworker did mention at second slide, more than a half of respondents prefer to use a chatbot rather than um, medical health declaration because it is easier, faster, and more useful. And these are the other reason why Approximately 71% are less red high score for chatbot registration and utilization. After nine months of implementation, we got some valuable lessons learned. Uh, as my coworker did mention at the first of our contact that the private sector, they do not have the habit to submit the report. So to maintain the EPS for private sector network, we need to motivate, encourage the private sector make them be a part of the EPS, and this can be done with the support from the local authority. They can share the information uh, with the private sector uh, by invite them in, inviting them to the training uh, or the email, uh, recording, record the activity and the contribution in EPS by giving them the certificate, for example. Again, BSI Vietnam and private sector network will take only take over only the first two steps of EPS. The rest be under the CDC, Department of Health, and District Health Care Center. So a clo collaboration with, uh, among the BSI, in particularly private sector, with local health authorities is very important and necessary. On technical side, we still have some trouble with the chatbot and even with the DRS too. The chapel system would change without any notification and it makes interruption for in reporting case. Uh, we need a good internet connection to make the flow of questionnaires smoothly and faster. And sometimes our own provider, they have time to wait for the next question and understand the issue. So they can forget, they, they, they may forget to complete the flow or do not want to use any more because they think it can fuel, it takes time. And for aggregate data, it's limited compared to case-based event data. 
because for the chatbot, we have um we can submit um the report case by case, or we can submit the report by month. So sometimes it's hard um to combine the data. Uh, after all the lesson learned, yes, I Vietnam we realize that. Uh, the local health authority they play an important role, and they are the the key person in the EPS. So BSI Vietnam, we are currently we are building the capacity, supporting and developing the network, the private sector network, to support our local bundle by giving them the training and the workshop. The local health authority increasingly involved in supporting private sector to support the surveillance data. With these advantages of chatbot, we consider to apply this idea for other infectious disease and expand in other areas. With the use of the chatbot, we can have the real-time and good data capture system and then work. It's gonna support a lot to detect and record an user an user health event in future. And the other thing is very important is the chatbot. Uh, as my coworker mentioned, currently we are using the chatbot as a low platform, but we can apply this to other platforms like Viber or Messenger. And to maintain the chatbot, we, I mean that the local health authority needs to have a long-term contract or closer collaboration with the owner of the chatbot of the platform to take advantage of the chatbot. And BSI, we did do a similar work in Laos and Myanmar for the reporting the malaria case and fever case and for the TB by using the chatbot at Messenger, Viber, and WhatsApp platform. Uh, there are still many things that we want to present, but that all we can share for now. If you want to ask for more detail or have any question, concern, please feel free to email us or give us your question with, uh, at the chat conversation. Thanks for your listening and attention. Thank you, Hua and Huang and Natalie and Emma. These were just absolutely fantastic presentations. Um, so I encourage everyone to please, please do visit the uh, community of practice posts. They're in the channel right now. I already see that there's a lot of activity and there are some questions happening. And unfortunately, we, we don't have time for live Q&A. Um, so I'll just close with a couple of reflections around what an amazing use case this is, a set of use cases from the community that really brings together um, data points, non-traditional data points uh, for DHIS2 as an HMIS from provider, uh, private providers, from community listeners, from community leaders. Um, I've seen all of these use cases are really focusing on understanding these complex data flows, um, but they're also quite driven by a real-time analysis of this unstructured data and trying to bring meaning to it. And that meaning is, is consistently tied with actions, um, which I just find incredibly impressive as we look to um, how data use is actually driving our decisions. So um, the last thing is just also this ability to, to sustain the motivation of these quote, sort of non-traditional reporters and, and try to do this through channels that are accessible. Um, so SMS and WhatsApp and really looking at DHIS2 as a platform uh, for integration of data, but also with other systems and communication tools and social media apps that are out there. So I um, congratulate our presenters today. Please do follow up on the community of practice. And I think with this, we can formally close the session. And I don't know if Max has any announcements, but thank you very much.